Thank you, Jenny. I, I'd just like to first thank everybody at the Center for Ballet and the Arts, uh, Jenny, Emily, Andrea, and uh, Kelly for all their help getting this together. Um, also like to thank, we have a whole bunch of people from the Calder Foundation, without which I can't do anything these days, it seems. <laughs> like, uh, I, I, I won't mention everybody, but I would like to say thank you to Susan Dam, who's the uh, Director of Research and Publications there. I had desperately emailed her this morning with a question. Um, but it, so two great institutions, the Center for Ballet and Arts, Calder Foundation. We also have uh, a, uh, a Calder grandson here, uh, Holton Rower, and a Calder great-grandson, Griffin Rower Upjohn, are here today. So uh, as, as Jenny said, I, I've been working for six or seven years on the first full-length biography of Alexander Calder. What I want to talk about this evening is Calder's interest in dance. There are so many aspects to Calder's interest in dance, ballet, in particular dance, and theatrical movement more generally. There's so many aspects to his interest, so many aspects to his engagement, that what I thought I would try to do this evening is give you a series of, of really glimpses of Calder uh, and the dance. And I thought a fun way to do that would be in the form of an alphabet. So I am literally going to go from A to Z. And each letter of the alphabet is going to elicit a kind of glimpse of some aspect of this enormous subject. I'm going to be moving fairly quickly. And I invite you to ask questions at the end. And I'll answer to the best of my ability. There are many aspects of this story about which uh, we know less than we would like to know. So without further ado, A is for Amérique. Uh, beginning in 1918 and completing the final version in 1927, Edgar Varese uh, composed an enormous orchestral work called Amérique. In 1971, when Calder was 73, Calder was born in 1898. He did sets and uh, a backdrop and costumes for uh, a ballet uh, put on by a new regional French ballet company, a ballet called Amérique done uh, to the Varese score. Uh, the choreographer was Norbert Schmucke. Calder, I don't know if Calder ever said no to an opportunity to work in the theater. He, he was avid for work in the theater. But in this case, I think it's pretty clear that part of the impulse was to honor of an old friend. Calder had met a Varese around 1930. We're not sure exactly when. And uh, uh, Varese had died in 1965. And so this is six years later, five or six years later. And Calder is sort of saluting his old friend. Uh, Calder and Varese were part of a kind of transatlantic uh, artistic avant-garde in the 30s. They were both men who were committed to traditions in their arts. And they were both, at the same time, uh, deeply engaged in fresh possibilities, new possibilities, expanding possibilities, in Varese's case for sound, in uh, Calder's case for sight. Calder, around 1930, did a, a wire portrait he did of, of Varese, which you see on the left. He did a whole series of wire portraits of friends, mostly around 19, in the years around then. On the right is a, a music stand that Calder made for Varese a number of years later. Uh, Calder actually took his mother. His Calder's mother was a painter by the name of Nanette Letterer Calder. And around the time Calder was getting to know Varese, he took his mother to a performance of Amérique in New York. And uh, his mother was always writing letters to Calder's sister, who lived in California at the time, was a couple of years older than Calder. And she wrote, uh, we know about this because uh, Nanette Calder wrote to Peggy, called her sister, saying that uh, of Amérique, there had been some really beautiful harp music, but the part that Calder liked were the sirens. And then uh, the, uh, Calder's mother wrote to Calder's sister, Sandy has rhythm because he dances, but otherwise, so far, I think music is not in him. B, of course, is for Balanchine. Uh, Balanchine, uh, you see on the right. On the left, you have 
a photograph of Calder's first show in 1934 at the Pierre Matisse Gallery in New York, which showed his work for about a decade. And we now know from the unpublished diaries of Lincoln Kirstein, which are shortly going to be published uh, by the Aikens Press Foundation, and I see <laughs> Peter Kayafis has just come in, who is going to publish the Kirstein diaries of 1930, sorry, 1943, uh, sorry, 1933, 1934. Um, and on April 10th, 1934, Kirstein wrote in his diary that he'd taken Balanchine to the Pierre Matisse Gallery to see uh, Calder's work. And uh, Kirstein wrote, Balanchine thought he might make, he might, he, Calder, might make fine decor for ballet, great big toys. This, is, this apparently got Kirstein thinking that maybe he should bring Calder in to show something to Balanchine. And indeed, flash forward to the next October, and we find this entry in Kirstein's diaries. Sandy Calder into the school, that would be the School of American Ballet, with designs for a ballet on a pad of paper. And then Kirstein describes what he saw. A great red heart-like shape and his mobiles shooting around. I thought it might be nice, but Balanchine said it was too close to Miro's Jeu d'Enfant, Jeu d'Enfant being the uh, miro messine collaboration of two years earlier, and Miro was a close friend of Calder's. And then Kirstein went on to say, I'm always too enthusiastic about possible collaborations, and I'd superficially thought Sandy, with his pure color, would be good for Bach. Apparently, there was some talk at that point about a Bach uh, a, a dance, a ballet to Bach, but it's probably not clear what the Bach was or what they were thinking about in 34. Then there's nothing more for about 35 years. And then a friend of Calder's, uh, sometime in the 70s, she can't remember quite when, walks into the Pearls Gallery on Madison Avenue where Calder hung out a lot. He showed at the Pearls Gallery in the 60s and 70s, and he and his wife, Louisa, would stay at the Pearls Gallery when they were in New York. This friend comes in and says, is Sandy here? And she's led to a room, and in that room are Calder and Balanchine having some kind of a meeting. We don't know what it was about. It may have been that Balanchine was thinking about bringing to New York uh, a work that I'll talk about a little later called Work in Progress, a 19-minute ballet without dancers that Calder had created at the Rome Opera House in 68. And apparently Balanchine had some interest in bringing it to New York. So there are these sort of three close encounters, if you will, between Balanchine and Calder, uh, but nothing really ever seems to have come of them. C is for the Charleston. The Charleston climax is the height of the Charleston is somewhere around 1926. That's the year that Calder, at the age of 28, first goes to Paris. Uh, th three years later, in 1929, he meets on a boat going back to the US a woman named Louisa James, a great niece of Henry James. Uh, they are married about a year and a half later, the beginning of 1931. And the Charleston is a helpful vision to keep in mind. This is uh, Josephine Baker dancing the Charleston. To keep in mind when you think about Calder, because I think one of the keys to Calder um, and to the life that he and Louisa led then for decades and decades is that they are products of the 1920s. And the, many of the qualities of Calder, the ebullience, the experimental what the hell spirit, much of this has its origins, has its core in the 1920s. D is for the dancer and the dance. Calder died uh, in the fall of 1976. And uh, about a month later, there was a, a memorial service at the Whitney Museum of American Art, where at that time an enormous Calder show was on. Um, and among the people who spoke at the memorial service were Arthur Miller, the playwright, who was a good friend of the Calders from Connecticut, uh, Saul Steinberg, who had become a friend of the Calders immediately when he arrived in America in the 1940s. Uh, the Calders, during World War II, Sandy and Louisa were a sort of welcome uh, committee for 
both people they'd known in Europe, uh, they spent a lot of time in Europe in the, in the 20s and 30s, but also from people they hadn't known because they had this kind of very cosmopolitan viewpoint, they spoke French, they were at ease with a, a, a kind of international experience that was harder for some Americans to understand. So, um, uh, and along with Steinberg and Miller, another person who spoke at the memorial service in 76 was James Johnson Sweeney, who you see is the second from the left in this photograph. Um, this is a photograph taken in 1943 when Calder had what was really a breakthrough retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art, organized by his friend James Johnson Sweeney, a great curator, critic, and museum director. Calder is to Sweeney's left. Um, to Sweeney's right is the artist Yves Tanguy, and I believe it's Peter Bloom, a, a painter who was a friend of Calder's from Connecticut on Calder's left. Um, Calder and Sweeney shared just an enormous amount. They both had spent a lot of time in Paris in, in the 30s. Um, they, they were close to a lot of the same people, Miro, Leger, uh, and they shared this sense of, of being Americans who were also, in a sense, internationalists um, in the sense of being people who saw the enterprise of art as something that constantly crossed borders. There is a, uh, a tape of the memorial service, and there is nothing in the memorial service more extraordinary than Sweeney's uh, words about his old friend. Uh, Sweeney had a very deep, dramatic, melodious voice, um, and when he speaks, it's almost like some kind of Shakespearean oration. Uh, and he began and ended his remarks by alluding to William Butler Yeats's Among School Children. And he said at the end, Though the dancer has gone, that's Calder, though the dancer has gone, the dance remains. You have left us happiness, not sad sadness, Sandy. Miss you, we must. E is for Havelock Ellis, who in 1923 published a book called The Dance of Life. Uh, on the left, you have uh, the, the frontispiece and title page of a book of random writings by Calder's father, A. a Sterling, Alexander Sterling Calder, to publish in 1947, two years after Sterling Calder died by his wife, Nanette Calder. This is, the, this is a self-portrait by Sterling Calder, who's a very, uh, very, very elegant, handsome man. People who knew both Sterling and his son, Sandy, always commented that the father was the good-looking one. Uh, and many of you uh, know or have at least walked by uh, a, a work by Sterling Calder, which is, uh, as you're facing south, uh, at looking into Washington Square Park on the arch, the, the sculpture of George Washington's the Statesman on the right-hand side facing south is by Sterling Calder. As many of you know, both Calder's father, Sterling, and his grandfather were sculptors. His grandfather, Milne, Alexander Milne Calder, uh, designed uh, oversaw and himself carved many of the uh, sculptures on the Philadelphia City Hall. Uh, Sterling Calder was an enormous fan of Havelock Ellis. And in his remarks uh, that are collected in Thoughts of Alexander Sterling Calder, he writes with great enthusiasm about this book, The Dance of Life, uh, which was published in 1923. In 1923, Calder, who spent a number of years after college wandering around the United States not knowing what he wanted to do, he'd been trained as an engineer. Um, in 1923, he comes back to New York. He's decided he's going to be an artist, and he starts studying at the Art Students League where his father actually taught some. Um, but it seems to me impossible that, that our Calder, Sandy Calder, did not at least look into and probably read in its entirety The Dance of Life by Havelock Ellis. And this is, I think, an amazing book for anybody who's interested in the dance in the 20th century because it's a book that basically argues that dance is the key to all the arts. Ellis says, dancing and building are the two primary and essential arts. The art of dancing stands at the source of all the arts that express themselves first in the human person. The significance of dancing in the widest sense thus lies in the fact that it is simply an intimate, concrete appeal of a general rhythm, that general rhythm which marks not life only, but the universe. 
And if you think about the Calder Mobile, um, this great invention of Calder's in the 1930s, the idea of a rhythm, of the rhythm of dancing, which Ellis is saying is the rhythm of the universe, I think it's, this is clearly key to Calder's uh, uh, thinking. F is for the glory folk. Uh, in 1958, the first year of the Festival of Two Worlds in Spoleto, Calder uh, was commissioned, uh, partly by a friend of his, who will come back to a little later, uh, 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 Italian curator named Giovanni Carandente. He received the commission to do sets for uh, a dance by a man by the name of John Butler, who uh, had earlier worked with Martha Graham, a dance called the Glory Folk. Uh, you see here uh, a, a, a photograph of, of a performance of the Glory Folk at Spoleto. And Calder designed for the Glory Folk. The Glory Folk was a kind of Grammian, it seems, uh, a dan Amer dance about the American spirit. Uh, it, it's set in the, in the South. It's about uh, uh, worshipers at what Calder described as a shanty-like southern, poor southern church and some kind of mystical revelatory experience that they have. Um, and Calder designed the church, which is this stable with these kind of Gothic arch elements, which is basically in red. And then he designed this mobile, which is silver, which is a, a, one of a, a certain group of mo Calder mobiles, which are not painted, which, where you have the shining metal left bare. And one of the, what is very interesting about this, this project of the Glory Folk is that it gives us one of a few clues that we have as to ways of thinking about the mobile that Calder himself was reluctant to really get into. Calder's wife, Louisa, once said that Calder was the least symbolic person she'd ever met. Now, mobiles have qualities of the transcendent about them, the, uh, uh, the astral. Here's this creation of fra fragmented bits that move around in the, in the air, that seem freed from the earth, that are not nailed down to the ground, that seem to defy gravity. And there is a sense in mobiles of a kind of lightness, a certain kind of transcendence. Calder, by and large, did not want to talk about this kind of thing. But in a letter to his son-in-law, um, as he was working on this, he refers to the mobile in parentheses as revelation. And at the same time, a, a man working in the New York office of the Spoleto Festival by the name of Chandler Cowles wrote to Calder and said, I can hardly wait to see the effect of your, quote, holy ghost when it reveals itself in Spoleto. And there are then, much later in Calder's career, there are a number of times when people are trying to get him to make mobiles for, uh, for a, 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 a church or a cathedral, and there's some back and forth about this. But what we have here, and you can certainly feel it um, in, in this production shot with, with the dancers reaching up to this thing uh, as if it, it is a vision, we have a glimpse of Calder sneakily entertaining the thought of a mobile as suggesting revelation or transcendence or something holy. G is for Martha Graham. Uh, seen on the left in uh, a Frontier, for, uh, her first uh, expedition with Noguchi in 1935. Calder and Noguchi had been good friends in Paris in the late 20s. They were friends in the early 30s. It was one of those friendships that did not last over the years. Uh, Noguchi came to be rather jealous of Calder. There are, uh, people don't talk about this, this very much, but Calder drive, drove certain people crazy because he was he was, it's, he seemed endlessly cheerful. He did quite well in the world. And he seemed to have a kind of ease about everything. And certain artists got very grumpy about this, Noguchi being one of them. And Arshel Gorky, who knew him in Connecticut, was driven crazy by uh, Calder's good cheer. Although Calder was very kind to Gorky, uh, Gorky found it very hard to deal with, with Calder. Graham in 1934 and 5, just at the point where she's starting to work in Noguchi, she works with Calder twice. Um, uh, they first do some 
uh, collaborating uh, at a kind of workshop in the summer of 34. The next summer, uh, they work at Bennington on a dance called Panorama, a Graham dance, which I believe was never shown again. They then, shortly after that, in New York, work together on a work called Horizons. Um, if you read the reviews of these productions, uh, the reviewers 201 loved Graham's work, and they said, you've got to get this Alexander Calder out of here. It's awful. He's ruining everything. And my feeling is Graham and Calder remained friends for life. And I think she was actually very interested in the experiments that they were involved in together. But I think at some point, I mean, this is you know, close to the beginning of Graham's career, and I think she decides she can't fight the critics. We know not that much about these two collaborations. But we do know that for Panorama, done at Bennington in the summer of 35, uh, Calder devised elements, stage elements, that were actually going to be moved by the dancers as they danced. Um, and I have on the right uh, a photograph of, of Messine's uh, ode, uh, choreographed by, by Messine uh, in Paris. This is uh, one of the l later phase of the, of the Ballet Russe, uh, of Diaghilev's Ballet Russe, uh, in 1928, um, with sets, famous sets by Chelichev. And I don't know if Calder saw uh, Ode. Um, Calder was very sneaky about letting on what he knew and what he didn't. I've come to think more and more that he had read almost everything and he'd seen almost everything. We have only one documented sighting of him at the ballet in Paris, also thanks to Lincoln Kirstein. But uh, I, he may have seen Ode, or he certainly would have been aware of it. And in one of the things that Ode is famous for is the set where Lafar and other dancers actually moved, changed the configuration of these ropes and elements as they danced. And it seems to me possible that Calder had this in mind when he worked with Graham on Panorama in 35, though we will not ever really know. H is for Harvard. You have a young Lincoln Kirstein on the right, and you have Calder on the left around the same time. This is all around 1930 uh, with his, his little circus. In January 1930, Calder uh, had an exhibit of his wire sculptures at the Harvard Society uh, for Contemporary Art, the legendary organization founded by Lincoln Kirstein, his friend Eddie Warburg, uh, short-lived but uh, has lived on in memory. Calder uh, went up, uh, he actually made all the wire sculpture when he got up to Harvard. That's how the story is it's told. And he brought his circus, and there was a performance of the circus in, in Cambridge. Uh, now, by the time that Kirstein wrote about all of this in Mosaic, many decades later, Kirstein had become uh, very much against abstract art. And he could not stand Calder by then. He, he found Calder absolutely impossible. And, and, it's, and I think perhaps as a reflection of that, in Mosaic, uh, Kirstie is giving a kind of capsule description of, uh, of Calder. And in one sentence, he confuses the sculptor father with the sculptor grandfather and says that the bronze sculpture on the top of the Philadelphia City Hall is of Benjamin Franklin when it's of uh, uh, William Penn. Um, and I think all of this was, was sort of reflected Kirstein's ambivalence about Calder. But at the same time, although Kirstein, late in his life, was no friend of Calder or Calder's um, work, uh, he said that Calder's visit to Harvard was among the, quote, few golden hours of the Harvard Society. And of the performance of a circus in Cambridge, he had this to say. He remembered how, and I quote, unforgettably, before the show, before the circus began, with sly, self-deprecating ingenuity, he, that's Calder, he padded through his audience, handing out peanuts. And that Calder, that, that Kirstie remembered all these decades later, this sort of theatrical moment, I think is, is, uh, is a testament to uh, Calder's. That Kirstie remembered this all these years later, I think is a testament to Calder's theatrical chops, to, to what Kirstie saw 
and Kirstein, this great connoisseur of all kinds of theater, what he saw as Calder's sense of theater. Uh, oh, and the, I'm sorry, I should have shown you this. This is, these, these are uh, little fragments of the circus that uh, Calder would have been showing in Cambridge after handing out the peanuts. I is for Charles Ives. Uh, as a follow-up to Calder's sets and costumes for Amérique, the same company, uh, French regional company, in 1975 mounted Mobilissimo. Uh, if I understand it correctly, uh, they based the costumes on some of the unrealized studies for the costumes for Amérique. This, this was mounted a year after Calder, a year, I'm sorry, a year before Calder died. J is for Josephine Baker. Uh, Calder said that he never actually saw Baker perform in Paris, but among his earliest wire figure sculptures are the ones of Baker, including uh, the one on the left, which is uh, now lost, is from 1926. This is the year Calder arrived in Paris as a 28-year-old. Uh, the one on the right is, uh, I think we think, from the, from the next year. And I think clearly there's a sense of identification here. Josephine Baker, the unconventional American artist who became a sensation in Paris, who was a sensation in Paris when Calder got there, uh, much as Calder himself would become an American sensation in Paris and eventually all over Europe. K is for Kleist. <laughs> Many of you know uh, Kleist's great essay on the puppet theater, one of the sort of landmarks of, the roman of romantic thought about uh, the theater published in 1811. And on the right, you have the frontispiece of a, a, a 20th century edition of uh, the Kleist essay, which happens to have drawings by Stanley, Stanley William Hayter, the British printmaker who was a great friend of Calder's starting in the 1920s. And on the left, you have Calder, um, probably in the late 20s, holding a, uh, a, a Josephine Baker figure which is literally a kind of marionette. And I should say that although people nowadays talk about the uh, various figures in the Cirque Calder, the Calder Circus, um, uh, in different ways, in the first years that Calder was performing his circus in Paris, almost everybody who wrote about it referred to these figures, um, which he actually manually moved around. But they were referred to as marionettes or puppets. Um, Kleist. Uh, in his essay, his essay on the puppeteer, which is it's really a little short story. A, the narrator is in a, a German town, and he notices that a very well-known dancer who's performing seems fascinated by watching a kind of folk puppet theater at a, a little fair, fairground. And he asks him why, he, the, the narrator asks this dancer, why are you so fascinated by this awkward puppet theater? And the dancer says, well, you know, we human dancers um, we're too human. We, we have too many human thoughts and worries and concerns. And there is a purity about a puppet or a marionette, uh, a kind of, of, of uh, lack of consciousness which leads to a kind of essentialism. Um, and this is something you find only in puppets or in gods, the dancer says. Um, and Kleist has this idea that the string the, that holds uh, the marionette up is somehow becomes for the marionette a kind of avenue uh, to, the, to the transcendent, to some other uh, level of being. And I think this idea of the, uh, Kleist's idea of the puppeteer is actually very helpful when thinking about the art of the mobile, because the mobile is this uh, moving object which is held by, secured by this single string. And like a puppet, it seems to have a life of its own, a life uh, that it proceeds through moving, swaying, going up and down, uh, no matter, without human intervention. It has a life of its own. L is for Leger. Uh, Calder became good friends with Fernand Leger in the 1930s, and they were good friends until Leger's death in 1955. Before um, Calder got to Paris, Leger had been involved with the Ballet Suedos, doing sets and costumes for skating rink. On the right, you see a, a, 
a study for skating rink, and, and in 1923 doing sets and costumes for the creation of the world on the left. I mean, one of the things that made Calder so hungry to work in the theater was that he arrives in Paris in 26 at a time when almost every Parisian artist uh, of a certain note has already been working either for uh, Diaghilev and the Ballet Russe or for the Ballet Suedos or for one of the other smaller companies. And I actually think that particularly Leger's designs for the creation of the world had an impact on uh, Calder's work in 1968 at the Rome Opera House, which we'll talk about in a minute. M is for Massine, Leonid Massine. It could also be for Matisse. Um, there is, around the time that Calder and his wife, in 1933, after basically spending uh, a number of years in France, they come back to establish themselves in America. And um, there, there is, around this time, in fragmentary, fragmentary comments and letters to various people from Calder, discussions about his going to back to Europe, sometimes it's to London, he's going sometimes to Monte Carlo, to do something with Messine, who's now at this point running after Diaghilev's death, this is four years, five years after, four years after Diaghilev's death, running the Ballet Russe uh, de Monte Carlo. It's a beautiful uh, drawing of uh, Messine by Picasso, um, and on the left of Matisse, which I'll come to in a minute. Um, we don't exactly know what they were talking about. At some point, Calder says, Massine wants me to come in and fix something up, kind of be a, a set doctor or something. Calder says, I don't want to do that. Um, it may have been that uh, Mass uh, Calder wanted to do, fulfill his great dream of doing a ballet without dancers on stage, just with sculptural elements moving, which Massine didn't want. We're not sure. But there's an interesting... Uh, kind of after story to this, which is, um, as many of you know, Messine in the early 30s is thinking about what he calls symphonic ballets, uh, ballets where dancers uh, are not uh, relating a narrative so much as kind of they become forces. And in 1939, uh, he, uh, beginning a year earlier, but he collaborates with, with Matisse on uh, Rouge et Noir, um, a ballet uh, in which if you will, color-coded groups of dancers uh, fill the stage and move across the stage. This is a famous 1937 paper cutout by Matisse, one of the very first of Matisse's paper cutouts, an early study for Rouge et Noir. Um, and it seems to me possible that the kind of thing that Massine and Calder were talking about was a ballet where colors, um, dancers in certain colors, would reflect uh, or embody forces uh, combating, interacting on stage. N is for 19 minutes. In 1968, Calder fulfilled his lifelong dream of creating what he called a ballet with the out dancers at the Rome Opera House. Um, his friend Giovanni Carandente, uh, uh, who brought him to Spoleto in 58, uh, really was central in bringing this about. Calder called his ballet without dancers, work in progress, salute to James Joyce. Um, he had actually been James Joyce's daughter, Lucia's drawing teacher, briefly in Paris. Lucia Joyce, of course, as many of you know, uh, danced to some degree. Um, and work in progress is, is really an extraordinary achievement. Uh, seen in Rome in about three times for a period of about a decade, seen nowhere else in the world. It's, it's, a, it's a, an event about uh, creation, I think. It's about uh, the creation of the world. There are some scenes which I won't show you, um, which are almost Genesis-like with, with water and the beginning of sea creatures and air and, and flying creatures. It's also about Calder's own uh, life, his own evolution. He shows large versions of works done in various decades. Um, this is why he said, I should have called it my life in 18 minutes, in 19 minutes. Um, and it is also about the evolution and the life of works of art. Um, and he delighted the, the idea of putting these enormous mobiles on stage that then move, that take on a life of their own. The sculpture, almost Pygmalion-like, becoming an actor freely acting on stage. Um, 
there were a number of scenes, about something like a dozen, with, with curtains dropping between them. One scene consisted of a whole group of cyclists in these wonderful Calder costumes coming on the stage and doing ovals and figure eights. Um, Calder had always been interested in bicycling. In the 20s, when he was in New York, he had uh, uh, done a painting of a bicycle race. And in Paris, in the late 20s, he went everywhere on a bicycle. And he, he, he liked to wear sort of loud clothes. He had an orange suit he wore a lot in the late 20s. And there were actually newspaper accounts of him riding around Paris. The American, this kind of heavy, funny, looking, appealing American riding around Paris on, in his loud orange clothes on a bicycle. And I think this part of work in progress was a recollection of that. There's also an interest in work in progress in the coming into being of works of art. And Calder uses stagehands in the uh, in what I would think of as an Eastern way as these figures in black, as in Bunraku puppet theater, which come on stage, which make the action happen, but are not actually, they're sort of seen but unseen. And in one extraordinary scene, this group of stagehands rise from out of the floor, bearing a mobile, and at the same time, a wire comes down from the ceiling. They then attach the mobile to the wire. The mobile begins its movements, and then they leave the stage. And I think this is a kind of metaphor for the act of, of creation. O is for our examination round his factification for examination of work in progress, a book published in Paris in 1929 of essays uh, about James Joyce's Finnegan's Wake, unfinished at the time, known at that time as work in progress. The title Calder then uses 35 uh, some odd years later for his uh, Ballet Without Dancers in Rome. One of the essays in uh, this volume is by a, a writer named Robert McAllman, who certainly moved in the same circles as Calder in Paris. And his essay is called Mr. Joyce Directs an Irish Word Ballet. And um, I, I think one of the things you have to just understand about Paris in the late 20s and early 30s is that ballet, as McAllman explains, it's, it's kind of a metaphor at this point for the possibilities of art in general. And, he, and in his essay, uh, uh, McAllman talks about how ballet is less inhibited by the demands of meaning than literature and how this, in turn, uh, uh, kind of can help to precipitate in, in other kinds of artists a freeing from conventional uh, kinds of meanings. And, and McAlman also says, and I think this goes to the comic sense in Calder, he says, good comedy clowning, pantomime, nonsense, slapstick, drollery, does not appeal to the sense of humor by explanation, but by gesture. And that sense of gesture rather than explanation is very important, uh, certainly to Calder's art. P is for Provincetown players. In 1924, Calder briefly worked as a stagehand at the Provincetown players in New York, uh, where he worked under the direction of the great theatrical designer Cleon Throckmorton. This is one of Throckmorton's designs for an O'Neill play. There was a great deal of O'Neill uh, premiered at the Provincetown players. And, I, and Throckmorton was known for the dramatic shadow play in his uh, stage pictures. And I think this had a lifelong impact on Calder, who was fascinated by the shadows that Mobiles uh, projected. Um, and indeed, there are at least, we have at least one instance of Calder in a gallery in London using a flashlight to create shadows on the gallery walls. Q is for quartet or pas de quatre. The idea of the quartet, of the pas de quatre, of four dancing together, is one that Calder plays with in the 1930s, which you might say is, is the most furiously kind of dance besotted decade in his career. Um, on the left, you have uh, from 1936 Dancers in Sphere a mechanized uh, uh, sculpture. This was actually for many years in the collection of Yves, Yves Saint Laurent. On the right, you have an enlarged version done in 1961 of a 1938 work called Four Elements. Again, this idea and, and these, these elements each move in a different way. Again, this idea 
of, of dancing sculptures which dance uh, together. R is for Roxbury, Roxbury, Connecticut, where the Calders bought a rundown farmhouse uh, not that long after uh, coming back to America in the early 30s. Um, in the 40s and 50s, they had dance parties in Roxbury all the time. Um, and here on the left is a little Calder kind of pro, uh, poster or whatever for one of these parties. The photograph on the right is actually not in Roxbury. It's elsewhere in Connecticut at the house of the uh, collector and curator uh, James Thoreau Sobey. On the right, that's Louisa Calder, Calder's wife, playing her beloved accordion, which she loved playing at parties. And you have uh, Calder dancing, doing a high step with a woman who we think is a woman by the name of Margaret French. Um, uh, there don't seem to be any, any photographs, actually, of these Calder parties. But the accounts of Calder par parties go on and on. The son of, of, of good friends of theirs, a woman, uh, a guy named Guy Wolf, the son of, uh, of Robert and Elizabeth Wolf, told about when he was just a few years old, being you know, going with his parents to a party at the Calders and being sent upstairs to sleep. And he remembered, he think he was six at the time. Uh, sorry, I have I'm having allergies. Apologize for all my tissues here. Uh, he remembered waking up at 1:30 in the morning or something. And, coming down to the living room to find the whole room dancing, uh, uh, drinking, dancing, all these adults like in a kind of insane Bacchanalian dance. Um, and he, he, he told me about this a couple of years ago. Um, and he, like many people, commented that the Roxbury, the Calder House there in the 50s, it seemed like what people imagined the 1920s had been like. Um, another wonderful little glimpse of these, um, these parties. Um, the Calders became friends with a very young Ellsworth Kelly in France in 1953-54. And then Ellsworth Kelly comes back to America. And Ellsworth Kelly, I think at this point, was a very sober young man. And in 1954, Louisa, Calder's wife, sends a postcard to Ellsworth Kelly. Do you like to dance? We are having a party December 19th with a three-piece colored orchestra. If you would like to come, we can put you up. Or are you too serious for this sort of nonsense? If you like jazz, this ought to be good. Hope to see you soon. S is for the samba, never to be forgotten by guests at the, at the Calder's parties in Roxbury, the Latin records and the Latin moves and the dancing, the Calder's beloved samba, uh, which had what Calder called a distinctive shuffle, the body gliding sensuously, the arms probably doing something ornamental in the air, the variety of movements uh, that took place simultaneously, perhaps not unlike the movements of a mobile. The samba came into the Calder's world at the end of the 40s, when in 1948, they took their first trip to Brazil. And they loved Brazil. They loved South America. They, um, and they loved the samba. Uh, there are, in letters, they're, they're always saying to friends down there, would you send us a couple of the new samba records from this year? Um, and all their, their friends in Connecticut were introduced to the samba by the Calders. And in fact, they went back. And in 1960, they went back specifically for Carnival. It was a, a year when Carnival was practically rained out. But Calder apparently stood up half the night in the rain watching the dancers. T is for Virgil Thompson. Uh, in 1936, Virgil Thompson commissioned Calder uh, to do the sets for a staging of Satie's chamber opera, Socrat, on a triple bill at the Wadsworth Athenaeum in Hartford that also included a work by Balanchine. This is, in a sense, another close encounter. Uh, Serenata Magic, which was to music by Mozart, with decor by Chelichev, um, uh, danced by Filia Dubrovska, uh, an aging ballerina. I think somebody said this is her, was her last role. Five Girls and Lou Christensen, a very young, as many of you know, American dancer. Um, and this, uh, we, uh, this is a sketch Calder did of the decor on the right. And there was a reconstruction done of Socrat in 1976, uh, uh, right around the time that Calder died for the, at the time of the Whitney retrospective, which you see on the left. Um, and it's, this is Calder in a very somber mood, which people sometimes don't give credit for, credit for being capable of. Um, the last part of Socrat is two excerpts from Plato's uh, dialogue about the death of Socrates. And Thompson, um, writing years later in his, uh, his autobiography, 
uh, spoke of the experience of Socrates in these words. So majestic was the slowness of the moving, so simple were the forms, so plain their meaning, that, ha that it has long remained in my memory as a stage achievement. Um, again, as with Kirstein, we have Virgil Thompson, another connoisseur of the theater, uh, saluting uh, Calder's genius in the theater. U is for what I'm calling unilateral ballets, ballets done without um, collaborators or unfulfilled projects. And there are many, many of these in the 1930s. Uh, on the left, you have uh, a letter uh, from Calder to his friend Sweeney, in which he has this drawing of what he calls um, uh, a sort of ballet of mine, where, as you see, you have people on the bottom manipulating elements uh, within a frame. Uh, he had set up in his studio at some point, 32, 33, what he called a Mary Can ballet with cans. And he comments here, as you see, that Verez, uh, his friend Verez, liked this. And then there is. Um, this set of studies uh, from 1934 for a ballet in four parts, I think it's not beyond possibility that this was something he may have been working on with Messine or wanted Messine uh, to work on. Uh, v is for Kurt Valentin. Kurt Valentin, a great uh, New York art dealer. Uh, uh, after a uh, Calder show with the Pierre Matisse Gallery for about a decade, um, uh, but they had a falling out in 1943. He then moved to the Kurt Valentin Gallery. Calder very rarely worked in bronze, um, which was his thought, one of, for his father, one of the essential uh, media. Um, but he did do, uh, in, in uh, the mid-40s, at the Kurt Valentin show, he presented a show of works in bronze, like The Dancer from 1944 on the left. And Kurt Valentin was, uh, was very important in the 40s and 50s, uh, uh, generally in terms of, of, of pu pushing interest in modern sculpture in America. Most dealers in 20th century art tended, certainly in America, to focus on, on paintings, on two-dimensional works. Valentin made uh, sculpture a specialty. And he was the person, he's generally regarded as the person who brought Degas sculpture to the attention of a wide public in the 40s and 50s. And I don't think it's beyond possibility that Calder, in uh, creating his dancer, which, which is, by, by the way, this is three different parts. And this can actually, uh, or is it four? I guess four, four different parts. Uh, so that this actually is a, a bronze a mobile you have here. But I, I actually, when I see these things together, I think Calder may well have also been saluting Degas' uh, bronzes at this, uh, with this work. W is for water ballet. Uh, for the 1939 New York World's Fair, Calder uh, received a commission from Consolidated Edison to create a fountain, what he called a water ballet, which was supposed to have syncopated jets of water, which would, uh, in, a, in a rhythmic pattern, project in various different directions. This um, was either very briefly or never executed um, at the fairground. And at le if not for all of the run of the fair, for 99% of it, what the, the, the water jets were merely jets of water streaming upward. Um, 25 years later, um, when Eero Saron and the architect asked Calder to do something for the General Motors Technical Center near Detroit, the idea of the water ballet was revived um, at, uh, out in Warren, uh, Michigan. Um, but I'm told it, that isn't in operation either now. Um, Calder and Water did not seem to uh, uh, do very well together. Uh, X is for xylophone. In the mid-1960s, the avant-garde composer Earl Brown, uh, who moved in the same circles as John Cage, and some of you know uh, Earl Brown's first wife, Carolyn Brown, danced with Merce Cunningham. Brown uh, went to Calder and asked for a mobile to be the centerpiece of a percussion work he was thinking about. Calder made him a mobile for the occasion, a standing mobile, which you see here, um, called, which Calder called uh, 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 Chef d'Orchestra. And uh, you had the mobile in the center, and then there were four stations with uh, large groups of percussion instruments. This work was just performed for the first time in 30 some odd years at Tate Modern in London. Um, and you have four percussionists who 
uh, stand at these four percussion stations, and at certain points in the piece, the piece is about 20 minutes, they move to the mobile and strike the mobile in various ways. And then depending on how the mobile moves, they go back to their stations and play different things in different ways. It's always been slightly unclear to me how exactly this is supposed to work. But Calder, but Brown was very interested in the idea of a structure that both had fixed elements, but that those fixed elements could relate in different ways. He saw this idea in Calder, Brown saw it in Calder, and he was, uh, he leapt at the opportunity to incorporate a Calder into his own work. Why is for youth? Uh, when Calder was a little boy, his family lived for several generations in Pasadena, for several, sorry, several years in Pasadena, California. And Calder would never forget the pageantry of the Tournament of Roses, uh, the, 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 the theater of this event, uh, which has all kinds of uh, repercussions and echoes in his uh, work really all through his career. There was, there's a mobile I was just looking at uh, the other day uh, in the Stanford Museum in Palo Alto, California, which is called Chariot, partly a reminiscence of chariots uh, at the Tournament of Roses. Finally, Z is for Zarathustra. The work you see here is Tightrope from 1936 in a beautiful, very dramatic photograph by Calder's uh, good friend, Herbert Matter. Um, it, Nietzsche, in Thus Spake Zarathustra, has uh, Zarathustra say the following about tightropes and to the tightrope walker. And I think this, again, suggests a more a somber, a graver, if you will, side of Calder. Uh, Zarathustra says, man is a rope stretched between the animal and the superman, a rope over an abyss a dangerous crossing, a dangerous wayfaring, a dangerous looking back, a dangerous trembling and halting. What is great in man is that he is a bridge and not a goal. Thank you very much. Thanks. I, mean, I guess we can, we can have a few questions if people would like to ask a few questions. <laughs> then we can just go drink. Yes, Jenny. What, so you, you said at the beginning that he was reluctant to talk about certain aspects. Um, can you explain a little bit more about, about what exactly? <laughs> Uh, well, I think Jenny and I, Jenny, who's also struggling writing a biography of an artist, I think we talked about this. Um, I, I think artists are always in a predicament. I, I think great artists. Uh, scarf up everything around them. They, they take from everywhere. And I think one of the worries that artists have is that if they talk too much about what they've taken from where, people are going to say they're just copycats. Um, and I think, I actually have come to think, after living with Calder for low these many years, that he was overly secretive and overly circumspect mm -hmm. about how much he knew. Um, his father, Sterling, had been a kind of tormented fan de esthete. His father endlessly talked about the nature of beauty and uh, the nature of reality, the nature of art. And Calder's parents, who were both artists, drove their son and, and daughter crazy with these endless discussions. Um, and I think Calder decided he'd had eno enough of that. So he was very circumspect about what he knew. But more and more, as I look at all of this, um, he was tr tremendously well read. Okay. Um, uh, for instance, he's going to India with his wife, and then it turns out that he had read a passage to India by Ian Forster, it sounds like right when it came out in the 20s. Um, he, right when he goes to Europe, he writes his parents from London where he is, and he's all over the museums, and he's discussing Blake and Hogarth and in great detail, and, and Jacob Epstein's newest sculpture. Um, he goes to Paris, he's writing home, oh, the only thing I liked in the concert last week was Berlioz. You know, so I think he's very, very sophisticated. He grew up in a very sophisticated family. When he was very sick in, the, in his 20s, uh, he was home for a while. Reading King Lear was the family entertainment. Okay? He was very shocked when he was at the Art Students League. He went to a, a Broadway play with another student there. And he writes to his sister that this young man who grew up in New Jersey had never been to a play. Now, Calder's father was a, a theater addict. 
And they went to, to the theater all the time. Uh, his father was a, a great admirer of George Bernard Shaw. So I think Calder did not want to let on how much he knew because he didn't want to be seen as a kind of pedantic artist. In the end, I actually think he hurt himself. I think he would have done better if he'd said a little bit more because by the 70s, he got this reputation of being the clown, this kind of happy amuser of people, when in fact, mm -hmm. uh, he was somebody who thought very deeply about all these matters. Um, his father taught in Pasadena. It, wasn't it the um, trip Polytechnic? Um, he, he didn't teach in Pasadena. His father um, did a mural at, at what is uh, uh, what is now uh, it's no, it was uh, uh, Calif uh, what, uh, California. I can't remember now. What it's, I'm having a blank about well, the name. Was, I think it was originally called Troop. I think it was originally like Trump or Troop. Politics. Right, the Troop, the, the um, Troops, and then it became Caltech. Caltech, Caltech, right, and I think right. maybe it's been renamed. I don't know, it's but yes, he did. Um, the reason they were in Pasadena was called his father had gotten tuberculosis um, in 1906, and he went for the cure to. Uh, the Southwest, and then when he was cured, the doctors still felt it was too dangerous to come back east. They went to, to Pasadena because there actually was a big arts community in Pasadena. A lot of uh, Easterners, sort of somewhat offbeat wealthy Easterners vacationed there. So yes, but he did, he, at the Troop Institute, he did a large uh, relief mur sculptural mural, which you can still see at, the, at, uh, uh, at there. Right. The reason the reason I bring that up is because um, at at the institute they were very um, interdisciplinary or transdisciplinary, and I wondered um, if that didn't lay some <laughs> groundwork somewhere. Um, Absolutely and totally. Uh, Pasadena was one of the centers of the arts and crafts movement in the early 20th century, and it is now my belief that Calder, when he was in 1909 or 1910, when he's 11 or so, he did two tiny metal animals, a dog and a cow. He thought these were so important that in the 1943 retrospective at the Museum of Modern Art, they were shown, these things he'd done when he was 11. I now think uh, he may have done them with the help of, a, of an arts and crafts metal worker by the name of Donaldson in Pasadena. His parents knew all these people. It's also because, it's a story that's somewhat buried because his parents, as fine art trained Easterners, a little bit looked down their noses at the arts and crafts movement. His parents, called his parents, thought that was a little bit artsy fartsy, if you will. But they knew all these people. Green and Green, the great architects. Among the Green and Green papers is Calder's mother's calling card, the net letter of Calder. They knew Green and Green. They, uh, they, so they knew all these people, yes. And, I, and I, act, I mean, I think you can make the argument that Calder's entire career is the fulfillment of the arts and crafts movement. What? Oh. Right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the cold, they, his parents also had friends even in New York who were into Everett Shin, the painter who was a close friend, ran a little amateur theater in the village. I mean, they, I, I mean, Calder grew up with all, all of this stuff was at his feet. Part of the reason he resisted becoming an artist until he was 25 was because he couldn't face the fact that he was going to do what mom and dad had been doing all along. It was very hard. He had to wait a while to face that. I try to stop. <laughs> <laughs> Trill me. Uh, I'm just wondering, is there film of work in progress? Because you there is a little bit of, of film. I don't know if it's on YouTube. Did, really, is it on YouTube? Uh, what? Yes. And it, it's, um, it's not a complete film, but it's fragmentary amateur video. And, and the reason I didn't show it was I've had too many experiences of with the PowerPoint when you have a, a moving images and you get to the place and then it doesn't work. So anyway, yes, but on YouTube or the Calder Foundation, you can see a little bit of, uh, of amateur uh, filming. And it's not in the proper order. You kind of have to read the... Uh, the praises of the scenes and everything to put the whole thing together and then include with that some of his drawings for sets to put the whole thing together. There isn't a complete. Uh, though the sets still exist at the Rome Opera House, actually. Anybody else? 
Okay. Jenny. Uh, can you can you just talk a little? I mean, this ballet without dancers yes. is, of course, really interesting to me. So, can, do we really know what it looked like and what its dramatic arc was, or? Well, look, I, mean, I how think. Much, how much evidence do we have, or are, does it does it still exist in in some form, or? Well, first of all, I think I, one thing probably should be said. Calder was, among, among the many things that Calder was aware of that he didn't want to let on about were a lot of experiments in uh, theatrical movement at the Bauhaus. There were experiments in Berlin, some with Russian constructivists. They'd all been going on sometime in the 20s into this period in the 30s when he's uh, doing this. Um, uh, work in progress is his most concrete uh, statement of this thing. Okay, and, and what work in progress is, is a set of, uh, you might say, uh, tableau vivant. In other words, the, the stagehands move on to stage, these big mobiles, uh, a curtain is pulled up and then they revolve and do their thing. And then as the curtain goes down and they go away, and then the curtain goes up again and the bicyclists come on, or as in the last scene, which I didn't talk about, curtain goes up and a, a, a pyramid has been moved onto stage, and then a, a man ascends into the pyramid and then waves a red kind of banner. Um, there are a lot of mechanical works from the 30s, like the dancers and sphere, and sphere that I showed you, where you have three or four sculptural elements that either with a crank or with a motor, motor move around in relation to one another. Okay. Um, so, so there was an idea that somehow you could propel elements that would become dancing elements without actual dancers. Um, or in the case of the first collaboration with Martha Graham, he wants to have dancers dancing and then uh, 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 these uh, sculptural elements propelled by the dancers. The, when Panorama was done at Bennington, apparently there were a lot of various snafus. Some of the elements turned out to be too heavy for the dancers to easily uh, move. Um, I think probably there are things that could have been you know, done about that, but he just then didn't get the opportunity. So I think, I mean, I think it's also, you know, perhaps the answer to your question really is that the great mobiles are ultimately uh, the ballet without dancers. That, that, that's what, the, what a mobile really was. I mean, he also, it's interesting, I mean, the motorized works mostly date from the 1930s. He partly became frustrated with the plain problems of motors. Uh, you, you put stuff up in a gallery and the motor breaks down two days later and the gallerist calls you and says, you know, who can fix it? Calder himself, surprisingly enough, was not always so great at these. He had other people helping him. Gallerists also back then got very annoyed with all the electrical outlets he needed, making holes in the floor for things. Um, so that's part of the reason he moved away from mechanized things. But I think the other reason was that when he finally discovered air-driven, wind-driven motion, um, he found that, in fact, it was much more interesting because it liberated the, th these elements to then have this, this kind of Kleistian life of their own, which they didn't, in fact, have um, with, if they were motorized, even though in some of the, mo the motorized works, he very brilliantly has different elements moving at different speeds. He can create a fairly complicated um, uh, interaction. Yes, question? I, I, I think I wish Susan was, Susan had to leave. I wish she might have a better answer than I do. I, I, I can't think of anything like that. He seems to have welcomed all opportunities to be involved in the dance, high and low. He himself was a kind of crazy, wild, improvisational dancer. His older daughter um, tells me a story. She went to the Putney School. Some of you may know of this sort of experimental school in Vermont. And she was mortified once as a teenager when he came up one weekend, she doesn't even know why he was up there. It was not a parents' weekend, and it was some kind of a school dance. And her father went out on the dance floor with the head of the school. And her father is out there, like, throwing himself around the dance floor. And his poor teenage daughter is like, oh my god, I mean, what is this? So, so he himself uh, really let loose, apparently, out there. Uh, we have one question. Yeah, hi. That's hi. incredible. It's better. Um, he said in the 30s, I think he said in the 30s, ballet was often used as a um, metaphor for the possibilities of all, of all the arts. Or it was, he referred to that lightly. And I, I, I wonder if you think that was coming out of Diaghilev alone. Cinema, we 
Um, I. I think so. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it's interesting that Robert McAlman talks about Joyce's Finnegan's Wake as a word ballet. Um, but certainly, yes, the broader world of dance, I mean, uh, I think there's a lot of interest now in the idea that, that you know, uh, the, the early years of, of abstract art somehow have various kinds of overlaps with, with the, sort of the beginnings of modern dance. And of course, remember, the ballet russe was in some to some significant degree, not what we would think of as ballet. A lot of it was more like modern, what we think of as modern dance. Um, uh, and, and even things like, I mean, I, really, I, I, I recently picked up a book about um, Isadora Duncan's influence on the visual arts. And it occurred to me that, I mean, some of the people who were interested in Calder early on, Cocteau and Picabia, were very interested in Duncan. And I think Duncan's experiments with a kind of free movement maybe in the background also of Calder. I, I mean, I think uh, the possibilities of theatrical dancing of various kinds, going from Josephine Baker to uh, uh, Massine or whatever, were just, I mean, this was a, an atmosphere that people were soaked in in Paris in these years. Um, and I, I just, I do think it's interesting that McAlman, I mean, James Joyce was virtually blind. Um, so ballet was not something he would be going to, but um, here is McAlman saying that Finnegan's Wake is a word, Irish word ballet, and Joyce's daughter dance. So I don't know. It's a, it's a, it's a thick stew, I think. <laughs> yes? No, they're very, I mean, it, you know, when I started seeing these mentions, like Calder would say to somebody, well, I may be here in October, but I may be in London with Massine. And I remember saying to uh, someone at the Calder Foundation, is, is Calder making this up to, to impress people you know, in, in America that he's working uh, with Massine? But there, are, but there are many of these things. So clearly something was afoot. Now, I don't know, maybe, I, I haven't looked at there. Maybe, I don't know if there are Massine papers where there might be something. But I think it is connected with Massine's interest in the idea of the symphonic Ballet. I mean, I think it seems like there could have been some kind of convergence here of interest. Uh, but I'm not sure we'll ever know that much about it. Yes? Not, not that we, we know of. Um, but, you know, I think, I mean, you look at some of the uh, uh, this, I mean, the, 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 some of the sort of, uh, you know, uh, early dance notations, and, uh, which were actually published in Calle d'Art, the magazine that everybody looked at, um, some of them look awfully like Calder things of one kind or another, um, these kind of schematic, uh, you know, uh, drawings of figures and figures in motion and interacting. And I think Calder probably saw that stuff. Um, and uh, again, I mean, some, you know, some of these things are imbibed, I think, semi-consciously. Some of it may have been involved, imbibed quite consciously, and he simply later on was not um, going to let on. It's very interesting. When you look at interviews with Calder, if a newspaper man who knows nothing about the arts goes to see Calder and asks a stupid question, Calder will give the dumbest answers you've ever heard in your entire life. He sounds like an absolute idiot. And I've learned that invariably, if you start reading an interview with Calder and he's saying really interesting things, and it could be about art, or it could be about the political situation in America in the 60s and 70s, where he and his wife were very involved as sort of left liberals. Um, and he'll, he'll go into great detail very thoughtfully. And then if you look at who the interviewer is, it turns out to be some well-known French novelist. So if he was talking with somebody intelligent and thoughtful, he really would open up about these things. But if it were just somebody asking dumb questions, he was like, are you kidding? And he would give a dumb answer. <laughs> well, Thank you. Okay. That's all.